Psalms, we're going to be looking at a few different places. A couple of them are Psalms 119 and, and uh, Luke 19. But uh, as you're turning there, um, I realized I am so glad to be in Texas again just the other day. I mean, it's just like Texas is some other place, man. I mean, it's so different from everywhere else, and I love it. Love it. Proud to be a son of Texas and glad I could get back here as quick as I could. We were at the bank the other day, myself, Brother Billy, and Miss Leslie. We were at the bank doing a little transactions on behalf of the church. And uh, they told us at the bank, said, okay, we're going to need your driver's license and a secondary form of identification. Uh, like your social security card. Well, I wasn't prepped for that. And I said, I don't have my social security card. And she said, that's okay, hon. Do you have your hunting license? <laughs> I mean, as a third form, can you just show me your belt buckle? You know, I mean, all right. Hallelujah. Man, you can't get that. Come on, they don't do that in New York. You know what I'm saying? I'm so glad to be back in Texas. I'm glad. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad somebody is. The uh, There's a few people glad we left Arkansas, but I'll leave that alone. So I uh, just also uh, want to just make mention to uh, some of our ladies. We're uh, doing some uh, work in our greeters and ushers groups. Uh, out at the front door, and how many you know you need to have nice, friendly people at the front door? And uh, we'd like to put some some pretty faces out at the front door too. Not saying anything bad about the guys, but I don't want to call my guys pretty. You're welcome. You're welcome. But uh, we are wanting to uh, just make available if some of our ladies would like to help with our first impressions of our church. And uh, would be interested in serving with our ushers and greeters. Uh, you can be sure to let Mr. Gary Cox know, and uh, or myself. And we'll be having an ushers and greeters training day coming up pretty quick. And uh, so as we announce that, and uh, you want to be a part of it, come be a part of it. Uh, everybody needs to have a job in the church. Now, if you're not friendly, I don't want you there. If you're just mean and cantankerous, I got something else for you to do. We'll we'll put you out there, you know, mowing grass or something. But uh, um, we want everybody to have an opportunity, and uh, so thank you for thank you for your work that you do here at our church. Last week we started down a little bit of a journey, sort of a self discovery that we're going through right now, and uh, adventuring towards our purpose for life and our life in Jesus, because this is something that I've found over the years. It's a constant repetitious thing. Brother Mike, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. That's usually the younger ones or older ones that have gone through a major life crisis in turnover and identity. and uh, Or when they come to Jesus and say, I don't know what God wants me to do with my life. We look at others doing things, especially when you're looking at social media and look at other people living their life and you say, why can't my life look like that? And odds are your life does look like that, just with different pictures on it. And Because uh, you know, just because they're smiling on Facebook does not mean they're smiling at home. But we're unsure about ourselves. We don't know about ourselves. What, are, what am I supposed to do? And oftentimes we can't find our purpose for life because of misunderstandings on our part or just flat out selfishness. Well, God, I don't want to do that because I got other things I want to do. Let's be honest, okay? So as we continue on this journey this week, I want to help you confront this in your life as your pastor because that's what I do. I confront you. Hallelujah. If you don't believe it, just watch me walk up to you at Walmart and you're immediately going to stiffen up and go through this transaction in your mind of was I doing something wrong when he showed up? <laughs> Did I say something I shouldn't have said? So... As your pastor, I want to help you navigate this part of your life. One, for your own faithful walk in Christ. I want to see you live your best Christ life now. I want you to be excited about Jesus because He's excitable. I want you excited about the Bible because that's actually a fantastic book. 
I want you excited about your church. Because it's better than the dentist office. You know? I want also to bring help you to bring the greatest satisfaction in your life that God has given you. I want you satisfied with you. With this life. Because guess what? It's the only one you get. You don't get to turn the hourglass over. You don't get to run the odometer backwards. This is all you got. So live this as your best life now. I want to help you do that. So we begin with the realization that following our introduction to salvation, this is what we were talking about last week, our first discovery is love that only God can give and reveal to us. We can't love the way we need to apart from Jesus Christ because our love tends to be based in selfishness. I will love you if you do these things for me, but if you don't do these things for me, then I won't love you. My wife and I are watching a video that we saw recently where the woman was saying, I love my kids not for what they give me because let's be honest, what can kids give us? In the younger stages, it's a lot of sleepless nights and poopy diapers. As they get older, it's a lot of house mess, headache, and, and, and frustration, you know, uh, with their talking back and everything. And yet, as a parent, I'll work hard to give my kids the love and everything they need, not because of what they give back to me, but because that's what I'm supposed to do as their parent. But then look at your marriage. And you would say, I will give you love if you'll do these things for me. But if you don't do these things for me, then I'm not giving you love. When that's counterintuitive to how we parent. If we actually showed love to our spouse the way that we... Mm, I'm about to preach here. If we showed love to our spouse the way we do our children, I will love you no matter how you treat me. I'm going to care for you no matter how you treat me. And suddenly we find that the, the whole atmosphere of our marriage is changing because instead of it, what I'm getting out of it, because let's be honest, as a parent, you ain't getting nothing out of it for a while. So grandkids, but as a husband, as a wife, what if we gave that kind of love to our spouse? What if our spouses gave that kind of love to us? Because I know what you're thinking, boy, I wish my spouse could have heard that. No, you need to be giving. You need to be giving. Only God can give us this love that we need to give to one another. It's a supernatural love from God because it's hard to love people. Man, I love pastoring. I love ministry. It's people I can't stand. You know what I'm saying? Some of you are like, preacher, that's not very nice. You come pastor a church. Come on. In it's the initial point of beating of defeating the selfishness in us. When we have love, true love, that sacrificial love, that love that I'm going to give no matter what you're doing to me. When we are able to give that kind of love that only God can help us to do, that's where selfishness dies. And that's what's supposed to happen in our life. Now, as we discover the second destination of the journey we're going today, it's to find our overall driving commission in this life. What drives you? What's the thing that drives you? You know, watching these little kids at the rodeo yesterday. Man, I, some of these kids, I mean, they go faster on a horse than I ever could. Well, I'm fatter, but... These kids, I mean, they're they're like hair blowing way out here, man. And I mean, they're just taking off round in barrels. And, and uh, you could tell they loved what they were doing. What drives you? We all desire something that drives our life and our passions, providing they're healthy and they lead to good things. Because if our passions are not grounded in Christ, again, the selfishness, will cause it to destroy us and those we love. I have a passion and you're not it. I have something else I want to do and you're not it. Come on, Brad Paisley sang a song about this, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to miss, oh look, there's a bye, you know. Remember that one? 
That's an old song, I know. I know. But some of you, if our passions aren't correct, it'll draw us away from everything that's actually good for us. In 1844, Alexander Dumas published one of his greatest works, the novel, The Count of Monte Cristo. You just thought it's a sandwich. No, it actually started with a story. This is the, also the same guy that wrote The Three Musketeers. They get, isn't it amazing? All of his stories, people are naming food after it. What does that mean? I don't know. The historical setting is kind of important. It's, it's way, way, way back in the days. You can tell by the picture. And uh, in the, the element of the book, it's, it's, a, it's an adventure story. It's got hope and justice and vengeance and mercy and forgiveness. But the main part of the story is vengeance. Getting revenge for what was done to me. It centers around a man who was wrongfully imprisoned. He escapes from jail. He acquires a fortune. And he sets about exacting revenge on those that were responsible for his imprisonment and everything that he lost. And it's a bitter journey of retribution. You're talking 1815 to 1850. 35 years of holding a grudge. 35 years of enacting a plan of revenge to get back at those that did wrong to you. Full of bitterness, full of anger. Now, the story will go on and it, and it ends, hallelujah, with a little bit of redemption. There's some forgiveness and, and some mercy, but the fact remains that the Count spent decades nursing a grudge. He was wasting his life and his happiness because his driving ambition, the thing that drove his life, was anger and revenge. How many can think that would be a terrible way to live? Terrible way to live. While the story does, uh, and, and it, it just spirals downhill, it makes us look at our own life at some of the rabbit holes of bitterness that we've had. The Lord establishes a purpose for our life that once we choose that redemption that God extends to us, suddenly I have a whole new life. Something changes in me. I've got a new way of living. And it's a plan to live the rest of your remaining years accomplishing two things. Last week we talked about loving God and loving others. That's what Jesus said. The, the most important commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul. And then Jesus said, and the second one is just as important. You wanted one, but I'm giving you two because you can't have them separated. Love God, love your neighbor. And Jesus said, all the Bible is grounded on that statement. Well, then we take it a step further and what is our primary ambition for this life? And it's again, two things. To know God and to make Him known. Somebody say this with me. To know God and to make Him known. Say it again. To know God and to make Him known. This is what your life is all about. If you ever sat there thinking, well, what's this great thing God wants me to do? Well, let's just make it very simple real quick. This is it. Because when you get to heaven, God's not going to ask you about your 401k. He's not going to ask you about your bass boat. He's not going to ask you about your business. He's not going to ask you about your education. He's going to want to know... Did you know my son and what did you do with him? We are to know God and make him known. Once we find the ability to love God, then it helps us to discover that we really can love others just as he does. What a miracle. I can, you can look at the person next to you and you can love them. Or the person that has done you harm, you can love them. Amazing. It doesn't happen overnight, and it takes a changing in our thinking. But after experiencing this love, we also know we're on a path of discovering more about this God that chose us and gave His life for us. We must know God or we miss everything. I've got to know God. And it's amazing to me how much people know about stuff. Have you ever talked to somebody and they told you more about something than you really cared about? The more they talk, the more you wish they'd just shut up. Hey, it's a country church. We're just, 
Where's real around here? Man, I couldn't care less. Couldn't care less. You've been talking for 10 minutes and I was done with you eight minutes ago. But if we if we try to live this life without knowing God, and the sad part is, is there's many people who have gone to church all their life and they still are ignorant as a rock about God. So this is our lifetime journey. And we have to, even, even if you come to Jesus late in life, this is the rest of your life. I've got to know God. I need to know who He is. I've got to understand Him. I can't, I can't worship God or know God just because of what pastor says. I've got to know Him for myself. I've got to know who He is. We begin this process with two things. The Bible and the church. The Bible and the church. we got to have both of those. God's Word is God's way of showing us a clear picture of who He is and what we are to believe and how we're supposed to act. If you read the Bible, you'll begin to know who God is and what He requires of us. Psalms 119. Let's look at this while I take a cool drink of water here. Because I'm starting to sound like Jeremiah the bullfrog. <clears throat> Joyful are people of integrity, hallelujah, who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey His law and search for Him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil and they walk only in His paths. You have charged us to keep your what? Commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Then I will not be ashamed when I am compared my life with your commands. Oh, look at that right there. There's going to come a day your life is going to be measured against the Word of God. I do not want you to be ashamed. I, I'm, I'm telling you, my life ambition as a pastor is not for here, it's for there. I want to see you stand before God and God says, well done, good and faithful servant, come on in. And I get to say, woo, I got to be a part of that. I got them in heaven. I help get them in heaven. I help get them in heaven. How'd they make it? <laughs> yeah. Wow. They really let everybody in here. No. That's my, 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 my heartbeat is I want to see your life compared to the Word of God. And God says, good job. Good job. It goes on and says, as I learn your righteous regulations, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your decrees, your word, the Bible. Please don't give up on me. Have you ever prayed that last, verse, last sentence? Don't give up on me, God. The Bible in general, in this chapter in particular, shows us that the Bible was meant to help not only correct our behaviors, but our attitudes as well that lead to life. There is a better way to live. That you can have joy. You can have excitement. The Bible's not boring. It really isn't when you understand what it's saying and how it can help you. Church isn't boring. We make it so. But when we understand what it, why it was meant, we come together and we help one another. In Deuteronomy 32 verse 47 says this, These instructions are not empty words. They are life. By obeying them, you will enjoy a long life in the land you will occupy when you cross the Jordan River. Jesus, when He was being tempted by Satan, in Matthew 4.4, 4, He responds to the devil saying, No, the Scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by T-bone and ribeye and shrimp and crab legs. Notice there's not a vegetable mentioned whatsoever. Okay. People, yeah, this is good gospel right here. I'm just saying. Y'all got that old vegan religion going on. I don't know. Or that. People do not live by bread alone, but what? But by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Can I tell you, when you're holding that Bible, you are holding every word that came out of the mouth of God. Who wrote the Bible? You could say men. No, men were the ones dictating what the Holy Spirit was saying. God wrote the Word. It was from Him. 
And it's meant to deliver us and help us. And even Jesus used the Word of God to shut the devil's mouth. God longs to be known by you. God does not want to be mysterious. God does not want to be misunderstood. He wants you to get Him. He really does. I, I had somebody come up to me one time and said, Brother Mike, I owe you an apology. I said, I didn't know this person very well. And I said, why? I said, because I had a bad first impression of you and I didn't like you. Thank you for your honesty. And it had come up to me and said, but I've gotten to know you and I still don't like it. No. I, <laughs> I've gotten to know you and, and I realized I was wrong. Now, how many of you have ever had that happen to you before where you, you misjudge somebody? Okay, that happens. That happens. God wants to be known. He does not want to be misjudged or misrepresented. The Bible was meant to give instruction and the church was meant to give support and opportunity. These things together create a whole person. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. That word motivate there, if you're reading in the King James, I believe, it says provoke. When I provoke somebody, it ain't for a good thing. That's why I like the newer representation of this. Because we're here to motivate, <coughs> excuse me, motivate one another <coughs> to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meetings together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. Now hear me. I'm not a killjoy pastor. I understand you're going to have some vacation time because I'm going to have some vacation time. So when you go on vacation, vacate. Man, go have a good time. But honey, when you come back home, I'm putting you back to work. Whatever you're going to get done this summer, get it done because when school starts, I'm telling you, you belong to me. And we're going to work. And we're going to reach people, okay? Those of you that have little kids, I, uh, you know, I'm amazed at some of our kids. They're rodeoing, stock showing, playing ball and all that stuff. If you can't make it on a Sunday, make it on a Wednesday. But listen, we need the church. We need one another. Why? Because we are better together. That was God's design, not anybody else's. God designed it when we are better for Him when we work together. So let us not neglect meeting together. Acts chapter 2, talking about the early church. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's son. sharing. Him. Come on, man. In its very beginning, the church was based on dinner. Some of y'all ain't shouting with me. I'm giving you good, I'm giving you good spiritual food here. So they devoted themselves to sharing the meals and to prayer, and a deep sense of awe came over all of them. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and they shared everything they had. They sold their property, their possessions, shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those that are being saved. Look at the last part of that. It says two things. They were enjoying the goodwill, meaning a good reputation, and people were joining the church. They had a good reputation, and the church was growing. Can I tell you why? Read the stuff we read prior to that. Because they were doing all these things, the blessings of God were coming upon them. This leads to the second driving commission that we have. The first is to know God, but the second is to make Him known. To make Him known. When Jesus was asked about His purpose here on the earth, Jesus' reply was this in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those that are what? Jesus did not say, I came to part the waters. I came to raise the dead. I came to feed 5,000. I came to do this miracle or that miracle and turn water into wine. No. Jesus said, my sole purpose for coming was to seek and save those that are lost. Can I tell you, that's our job as well. Brother Mike, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm telling you, the thing you're supposed to be doing is number one, knowing God, and secondly, making Him known. 
This is why we are alive. This is what makes us different. We're not different from monkeys just because of our appendages. Or as Brother Bob Miller used to say, you never seen a monkey monkey with another monkey's monkey? I still don't know what that means, but it was supposed to be something deeply theological. I don't come from some monkey. Some days I think my children were born from hyenas, but God created us the way we are for a specific purpose. We are different from every other form of creation. Why? Because God said, I want to have fellowship with mankind. I want to have friendship with mankind. Who knew that God really wanted to be with us? He loves you that much. To know Him and then to make Him known. Why? Because there's always room at the table for one more. As Jesus was leaving His disciples for the final time, He passed on the, the, what we call the Great Commission to us in Matthew 28. Jesus told His disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go and make disciples. Read that. Disciples, not converts. God called you to be a student. He calls you to be one that not only loves God, but you study about God. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. People need the same opportunity to know the saving and changing love of God like you and I do. And the hard part is, is we are God's plan A to make that happen. There is no plan B. Let that sink in. If people aren't hearing about God because of us, who are they hearing it from? We may be the only Bible some people read because they're watching our life. What are they learning? We may be the only Jesus other people see. What are they watching? Can I tell you, our life was meant to represent God. So when you say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life, this is where it starts. So take a good look at your life right now. Take a good look at your life, your daily life. Are you spending time learning about your Savior? Are you discovering change in your lifestyle and choices? And this change is the true mark of a Christian. How do I know that I'm born again? Because the Lord begins changing your values. He begins changing your wants and desires. He begins changing your lifestyle. He's, he's right there saying, hey, don't do that. Quit that. Don't wear that. <laughs> he saw that coming. He saw that coming a mile away. God begins changing us. Saying, I want you to be different. The mark of a Christian is that we are changing. Becoming less like who we are and more like Him. So are you spending time learning about your Savior? Are you discovering changes in your lifestyle and your choices? Are you sharing this hope with those around you? Some way, somehow. And if your response is no, then can I tell you, you're living contrary to God's plan for your life. God's not calling you to be a pastor like this. But can I tell you, God is calling you to be a witness out there. When people say, why are you so happy? What's going on in your life? When you have an opportunity to share the hope of Jesus Christ, but you're too ashamed to do it. Can I tell you, He wasn't ashamed to hang naked and broken on a cross for you. He's not asking you to die for Him. He's asking you to live for Him. And our purpose in this life, again, is to know God and make Him known. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is lesser in value. Does God have a problem with you getting a new boat? No, as long as you can afford it. Don't bankrupt yourself with the crazy thing. Does, does God have a problem with me having this hobby or doing this thing? No. God created us with desires and passions in this life. We all have things we enjoy doing, especially if it's doing nothing. Hallelujah. God gives us these passions, but all of that is secondary. Somebody hear me today. All the stuff of this life is secondary to that. 
If you are not knowing God and making Him known, you're putting other things in a priority it does not belong. And your life will collapse. Your life will collapse. That's why rich people are in addictions. Why famous people are killing themselves. They have everything that we could ever possibly imagine that we would ever want. And yet they're not happy to the point that they drink themselves into a stupor or try to kill themselves. Stuff will not make you happy. God will cause you to have a content life. The average Christian is grateful and content with less in their life because they know there's a life yet to come. I may not have it now, but I will have it then. You want to wear your gold now? Fine. We use it as road filler in heaven. Can't imagine, can't imagine heaven having a chug hole, but if it does, we fill it up with gold. God wants to give you the best life you can have. But this is where it starts. First of all, I know God, so I'm learning His love for Him and for others. And when that love begins flowing in my life, then I realize I've got to know more about Him. And I need to make Him know. Well, Brother Mike, I don't know that much about God. Fine. What do you know about Him? I know He loves me. I know He forgave me. Fine. Share that. Because listen, there's a lot of people who aren't going to come in here and, and come into this place and listen to Brother Mike's deep theological statements. But you know what? They'll sit in your house. They'll eat your cake. And they'll listen to you talk about, can I tell you something God did in my life? They'll listen to you before they'll ever listen to me. So I want you to bow your heads with me right now. This is where we need to be. This is where we need to be. So I ask you today, do you know the Lord as your Savior? If you do not, I'll tell you this is the day to do it. There's no reason for you to leave here today not having an introduction into a new life. God's not waiting for you to get ready. He's waiting for you to come to Him. If you wait to get ready, you'll never be ready. It just comes to the point, it's time to make a decision. If you're here today, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to pray with you. Are you here today and you say, Brother Mike, I need, I need to make some things right with God. I need Him to be the Lord of my life. Church, pray with me right now. If you're here today and you say, that's me, you know it is because it's Hammering in your heart. Hammering in your heart. With every head bowed, nobody looking around, that's you. Could you just slip up your hand and put it back down? I want to pray for you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. God loves you. He's crazy about you. He's not expecting His perfection. He's expecting just coming to Him just as you are. And we're going to start it right now. We're going to start that with a prayer. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. It's nothing magical, but I'm telling you, if you pray it with all your heart, it'll begin the changing that needs to happen in your life. Heads bowed. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus. Come on, say it with me. Lord Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. I come to you today with all my faults, all my failures. You already know them. So I confess them. I need you today, Lord. I choose you today to be my Lord. To help me live this life for you. I want to know you, God. And I want to know your love. I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. And let me have a new day. And may the rest of my tomorrows be yours. In Jesus' name. Lord God, I thank you right now for those that prayed that prayer. And Father, I pray that you would help them to feel the gravity of what they've just declared. They have given up and surrendered their life as they've made a mess of it, as we all have. And they're choosing today 
to be a new person. Father God, I pray, let this be a day that hammers home as a hallmark day for them. This is a paramount moment. Father, I pray for the rest of us right now. Because God, every one of us have to do a little bit of self-evaluating. Am I living this life right? Am I doing it the best and the way it's supposed to be? Am I knowing you and am I making you known? That Father, everything else is secondary. So Father God, I pray right now, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us for the things that we've put in front of you. Come on. Pray with me right now, church. You know what it is. That God, I pray that you'll forgive us for anything that we have worshipped instead of you. Anything that's been more important than you. And Father, what we pray is instead, may you become the most important facet of our life. God, I pray that you would help us to do this life right. You're not a killjoy. You're not here to tell us this is terrible and that's a sin and you're so bad. That's not what you do. But instead, it does have to be done right. And so, Father, help us to get the first two things accomplished and then the rest of it will sort itself out. And Father, I thank You for loving us. I thank You for caring about us. I thank You, Lord God, for being so good to us today. And God, we give You glory and praise right now. In Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. I want you to listen to me before we dismiss. Those of you that accepted Jesus Christ as your, into your heart, you've made a fresh commitment to God today. It may be for the first time. It may be for the hundredth time. I don't care. It'll stick if you let it. And what you need to do, there's a few things that we would like to encourage you to do. Number one, you need to have a Bible. You can get it on your cell phone. We'll give you one. we got Bibles here. But you need to get into that Word. You're not going to know God apart from that book. God's telling you what matters to Him. And so we, you need to be in that Bible. I want to encourage you. Secondly, you need to have a church family that will help you grow. We have Sunday school that's intentionally designed to help you know God and His Word. We want to invite you to come be a part with us. Third, I want to encourage you to be baptized. Bapti baptism, water baptism, is an outward expression of your inward decision. It's you telling everybody else, I've decided to live for Jesus. So I want to encourage you. If you need help in this walk, please come see me. My whole job is to be right here for you and to walk you through it. To walk you through it. To the rest of you, take this thought into mind right here to know God and to make Him known and weigh that with everything else. God doesn't have a problem with you bass fishing, taking your kids to baseball practice, but what He does want to make sure is make the first things first. Is everybody with me on that? Stand with me across this place. I want you to know my wife and I dearly love you very, very much. I'm glad we get to celebrate this Lord's Day with you. We hope that you have a good day and a good lunch. And uh, don't do no honeydews today. Just go home and get in that recliner. I just feel the Lord telling us that right now. We don't need to work on the Sabbath. That's good preaching right there. I couldn't get you to shout anything else in this message, but you shouted right there. God help you. Brother Ben, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer?